So this morning we'll finish up Job. If you remember, uh, there's two speeches. The first speech from God in Job uh, was chapter 38 through uh, chapter 40, verse 5, and it was basically uh, God saying, Job, where were you when I did this? Where were you? And a lot of nature, a lot of creation was involved in that. Uh, and at the end of it, Job was silent, and we said part of the reason for that, or part of the reason for a second speech, is that perhaps Job is silent, but kind of like if you get in an argument with somebody and, and you stop talk, talking because you get silent, it might be because you're not sure what your next argument might be. Your silence may not be that you're convinced. So Job may not be fully convinced. And now, now God brings the final speech here uh, in chapter 40 through 42. So this time in chapter 40, starting in verse 6, Job speak, God speaks to Job, but he adds some new elements to his speech. Um, there are two more nature poems in this chapter, um, and they are much longer than the poems in the first speech that God gave to Job. So it's much longer. Uh, the second nature poem here takes up one quarter of the space given to God uh, in his speeches. So these are longer, uh, and the second nature speech is much longer than the others. Um, so before God begins his poem here on, on animals, primarily on animals, there's a preface where he discusses the moral issues that Job has raised with his friends. And this could be the pivot point in God's reply to Job since it's placed between the four nature poems. So there were two nature poems we talked about two weeks ago. There's going to be two more today. Right between that is where, we're, where we are right now. And here in these verses, Job is reminded by God that he does not have the power to secure his own verdict with God of innocence or guilt. It's not up to Job. Uh, and in that culture, similar to today really, the judge who rendered a verdict was obligated to make sure that the, the justice of the verdict was carried out. So God will render the verdict and make sure justice is meted out. Um, so here, as God begins in the middle of these four speeches, the two from a couple weeks ago and now the two we'll talk about, to quote one, one Old Testament scholar, he says, quote, we suddenly see what all those apparently irrelevant excursions into nature, chapter 38, 39, were leading up to. Job now must realize that he is no more able to exercise jurisdiction in the moral realm than he is able to control the natural realm. Hence the question posed to Job, quote, have you an arm like God and can you thunder with a voice like his? So in between the four nature poems, God is saying, you can't render a verdict on creation, on the natural world. Why would you think you could render a verdict on the moral world? Why would you think you could do that, Job? So it's, it's again, putting Job in a, in a humbling position, but in a right position. God's not trying to just beat him up, but trying to say, realize your position here, Job. Um, so let's, let's go to these two, these two poems here. Um, there's two animals listed, and... There, you can go, go to a, a seminary library and you can find all kinds of journal articles on what these animals may or may not be. So we will not solve the dilemma of if these animals are real animals or if these are symbolic animals to demonstrate power on land and power on sea. There are thousands of journal articles going back to, really going back to the early church. But um, The first is behemoth. That's mentioned first in chapter 40 which represents or is the great land animal. So a great large beast. That's the one that is mentioned first by God, and that's behemoth. Then the second one mentioned in chapter 41 is Leviathan, which is this, which is this great sea creature, a creature of the, of, the, of the sea. So it's difficult to determine if, if these are intended by the author to be real creatures, in which case it might be a, a, a hippo, a crocodile, perhaps a whale with the sea creature. It's hard to know. So they could be those. It also could be just symbolic uh, language um, to convey truths to Job that he has no control in, over creation or over anything. Um, so if these are mythological descriptions or symbolic descriptions, they could be describing any number of ancient Near Eastern um, mythological beings. Again, I encourage you to visit Gordon Conwell Seminary, their library, Reformed Theological Seminary's library, Erskine uh, Theological Seminary's library. There are so many articles on this that it, we just won't go into it. The first one, though, will say a few things about this. In chapter 40, the, the animal listed is behemoth, and this is a land animal. That's the main thing you need to know. It's a land animal. Uh, the Hebrew word is the word for beast, plural word for beast. Um, 
And it's similar to an Egyptian word, uh, which would have been a, an ox in the water. So a large ox in the water. Um, also in Egypt, um, and again, we don't, know where, we don't know where Job was written, but in Egypt, both the, the crocodile and the hippos were captured and killed by Egyptians. So they have interaction in the Egyptian world, which is probably, I think it's safe to say, south of wherever Job is, south or southwest. They did have interaction with crocodiles and hippos and, and capture them. Um, so I, I think from all the reading I've done over, over the years, um, if this is a land animal, the, animal, probably the most reasonable interpretation would be a, a hippo, a large hippo that's on the land that you don't mess with because um, they didn't have high-powered rifles then uh, to take down a hippo. They would not mess with a, a hippo very much, um, a little bit in Egypt. Um, so it could be Thomas Aquinas, if, if you're interested in, in Roman Catholicism, uh, he interpreted it as an elephant. That's possible. Some have seen it as a crocodile. Um, hippo would be a, probably, a, I think, maybe the closer one. Um, if you look at verse 19, it has an interesting description. It says, this animal is the first or the chief of the works of God, which is kind of a reference. It could be an allusion back to Genesis 1.24. Uh, the creation of cattle as the first among the created order um, in Genesis chapter 1. So, and I think there's a reference there to the lotus plant, which was a thorny little shrub. The next animal is, is uh, the Leviathan. That's chapter 41. There's all kinds of description of chapter in 41, which is the longest nature poem uh, in Job on Leviathan, which is a sea creature. Um, if, it, if it's mythological or if it's symbolic, it could be referring to a sea dragon in Canaanite culture. Um, it could be that. Um, if it's an actual creature in the water, the most likely thing is that it's probably a crocodile, which the Egyptians especially had interaction with. And they would have written stories and poems about how difficult it was to deal with crocodiles. And, um, so it could have been a crocodile. Thomas Aquinas says it's a whale possibly hard to know how they would have much interaction with a whale other than just hearing stories of people traveling to the ancient corners of, of the known world. Um, but probably, I don't know, safe to say maybe if it is an animal crocodile, um, potentially. Um, and here's the bottom line. The bottom line is God is saying Job is helpless in the presence of a, the greatest land animal and the greatest sea creature. Job, what will you do? How will you defend yourself? How will you tell this animal what to do and provide for yourself, protect yourself? So verse 4, Job, could you make him your servant? Could you make him, verse 5, could you make this animal your pet? Verse 6, Job, could you capture and sell this animal? And the, affirmative, the answer to all that is not the affirmative yes, it is no. I can't do any of those things. And that's what God's point is. You can't even deal with these things. How can you deal with the moral order of uh, the loss of your property, the loss of your family, the loss of your money, the loss of all these things, your loss of your health. That's up to God. Uh, you can't even deal with animals. Um, interesting little side note, because it's in my notes. Um, the ancient historian Herodotus gives an account of how the Egyptians would capture crocodiles, um, if this is a crocodile, and how they would interact with it. That What the Egyptians would do is they would hook a large, they'd have a large hook with bait, and they'd put, uh, if they had it, a live pig on the on this large hook, and then they would start beating the pig on the banks of the river, and that would draw out the crocodiles, um, and then they would attempt to throw mud in the eyes of the crocodile. I mean, this is dangerous work. This is, this is officially a dirty job, right? They would throw mud in the eyes of the crocodile until they could get on it and capture it and secure it. That's how, that's how the Egyptians would go after crocodiles. So a, a team effort, by all, by all accounts, um, and not an animal you wanted to deal with. Um, and you, you see the difficulties of trying to deal with Leviathan in, in chapter 41, verse 11. Um, the, the challenge is the folly, verses 8 through 11, the folly of trying to deal with, with these animals. So Job 41, verse 11, Who is given to me, God says, that I should repay him? Does that have an echo in the New Testament? Do you hear, do you hear some Pauline theology, the Apostle Paul, uh, Romans chapter 11? So Romans 9 through 11, where Paul has talked about uh, God has given over the Jews to uh, the people of Israel um, to unbelief so that he might graft in the Gentiles, that's us, so that he might make one church, one tree. And he's done it through his decree of election. 
And as you get to the end of Romans 11, Paul is addressing the, the, the challenge of, of the audience, which is how is this possible? How can God reject his people to bring in the Gentiles and do it through election? How, how is God able to do that? And chapter 11 ends with Paul writing, who has given a gift to God that he might be repaid? What have you given to God that he's not already given to you? So all that to say Romans 11 really is an echo of Job 41, um, verse, verse 11. Uh, the rest of chapter 41 um, is devoted to a description of the animal. Like we talked about, there's a, a lot of different journal articles that you can find on these animals if you're interested, um, if you think they're symbolic, if you think they're mythological, if you think they're real. The point is, um, God is saying you can't deal with nature. You can't deal with that. How could you deal with the moral order? So let's jump to chapter 42. Um, Job's response. He's heard these, these words from the Lord. So we're going to jump to chapter 42. Uh, Job's first words to God are, you could paraphrase it in English as, God, you can do everything. None of your plans can be frustrated. Um, so by looking at the creatures of nature and God's governance, Job realizes he cannot begin to understand the power and the wisdom of God. Um, Job, one scholar says, quote, Job has grown in wisdom, he is at once delighted and ashamed. He's delighted to know and to have God speak to him, but he's ashamed that he would presume to know what God would do with his life. Um, there might be a lesson there for us. In verse 3a, chapter 42, verse 3a, Job repeats the question the Lord has asked him in chapter 38 too. Now Job answers it. He admits he spoke out of limited knowledge. He was confident in things that were too wonderful for him to understand. And he, re- he expresses regret for foolish words. Um, And so verse 6 of chapter 42 is a picture of Job as a humbled man. And humble in our culture often is a negative thing. Humble in the Bible is not a negative thing. Humble in the Bible means you know your right place in the world. You know, whether it's Moses, um, whether it is Job here, humility is knowing your place and not presuming to be above your place in the world. Um, A good lesson for me, a good lesson for all of us here. So verses 7 through 9 of chapter 42 is the verdict. Job has been addressed by God. Now his four friends um, are going to get some words from God. Eliphaz is addressed by name, if you notice that, which probably indicates that he's the oldest of the friends. He is the most, so he gets the most respect. He is, he is the elder, so to speak. And so although God is angry with them for their words towards, towards Job, he does not deal with them according to their sin. Um, And so God is angry with them, but he even shows more mercy than the friends that showed Job. Um, And Job's vindication is public. Job's vindication in his argument with his friends is made public um, so that the friends know that all of their time speaking against Job, um, they were in the wrong. Job was, to some degree, in the right. Um, That they were were wrong in accusing Job of sin, that they that they, they did not know what his sin was. Um, so none of the, in all their speeches, none of the friends considered the possibility that they, not Job, might be the objects of God's wrath. That's an interesting thought. In all the speeches that we talked about in April and in March, whenever we started, um, the friends never thought, maybe I'm the object of God's wrath because of my um, words against Job. And it's only here, this is where we'll, we'll get into for a moment, um, some of the redemptive historical stuff. It's only after a sacrifice is made and Job's prayer is given that Job's friends will be right before God. And so the sacrifice, to, the sacrifice for the sins of his friends is costly. Seven bulls, seven rams, which would have been afforded only by royalty or by a wealthy person in that culture. Uh, you didn't just have seven bulls and seven rams hanging out in the backyard that you could sacrifice. That is a costly expenditure. Um, and it's a burnt offering, which is important in the Old Testament. That means sins need to be covered. Important, significant sins need to be covered. And, and you place your hands on the bull, saying the sins of the people are placed on the, the animal. So all this is done, at Job as a mediator, we'll come back to that, for his friends. Uh, and seven, uh, as Thomas Aquinas said, we've got a lot of Aquinas, I apologize. I did not notice that until right now. Thomas Aquinas said, seven is the number of totality. So a sevenfold sacrifice is suitable for the expiation of grave sins. So there's a symbolic idea of totality of their sins. Um, And then God will accept their prayer. And literally the word accept, the literal 
meaning of that is his face I will lift up. So when it says God accepts you in the Old Testament, it means I will lift up your face so that you can see the countenance of God. That's an interesting image. Um, so if you, we'll, we'll take a quick moment because we're there uh, in my notes. If you look at verse, um, if you look at your handout, um, I, I know all of you can, I think all of you can read, right? Um, so I won't just read everything to you, but you can see how it's two sections the prologue, the beginning of Job, and the end of Job, how they are parallel. And I say that, I want you to know that the Bible is written not just by backwoods, rural people with no education who just couldn't write. These are educated people in the ancient Near East who are writing under the influence of the Holy Spirit and giving good literature, in case you missed that in Job. So the introduction of Job, and this is called an envelope structure, inclusio structure, chiastic structure, whatever you want to call it, um, at the beginning, Job lives a righteous life, and that is paralleled at the end by Job dying old and full of days. There's a, there's a, a satisfaction there. There's a, a righteousness. There is a goodness there, a shalom there in the Old Testament language. The second thing, Job's children, seven sons, three daughters, paralleled at the end, the epilogue, seven sons, three daughters. The third thing, all the flocks. Notice the numbers have changed. The flocks have doubled, so there's been a blessing on Job. Uh, material blessing, I should say, um, that is parallel at the end. Then D, the, the fourth thing that's mentioned in the prologue is Job's family members. Um, the fourth thing near the, in the epilogue is Job's family members are mentioned. Um, Job's afflictions are listed in chapter 1, verses 6 through 2, 10. Um, in, in the epilogue, they're reversed. So again, this is intentionally written in a parallel fashion. Then the three friends' names listed, they come to console him. Um, at the end, the names are listed, and they come to Job for help because they are indicted by God for their words against Job. And then finally, the friends are silent seven days and seven nights. Here, the beginning of the end is the friends are rebuked because of they, their words, because they did not remain silent. And there's seven bulls and seven rams that parallels the seven days and seven nights. So very interesting. It's, it's some of the literature um, we can talk about that more in a moment, but I thought that might be a helpful way uh, to look at that. Um, let's finish up with a couple thoughts here, then we'll, we'll talk um, over some of the Job stuff from the last few months. Uh, Job's restoration is not the result of his repentance in verse 6, but it's the result of his actions in chapter 42, verses 8 through 9. Um, many of his friends and acquaintances came to Job and ate with him and showed him sympathy. They brought him money and gold. Um, ancient uh, units of money um, to, uh, to give to him. Um, so there's a lot of money being exchanged here. And he, Job receives um, double of what he be, had at the beginning of the story. That's what you see on your, your thing. So your handout, 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, oxen, donkeys, uh, seven sons and three daughters. It's interesting here. I'm going quickly so we cover everything and have time to, to talk. It's interesting here in that culture uh, this, is, this is not Western culture. This is not the culture of America. In ancient Near East, the names of daughters would often not be listed. So it is unusual that they are listed here. Uh, and they are listed here um, is interesting. Um, it, it gives them emphasis uh, that they are important, they are value, and that they are part of the inheritance, which, again, not always normal in the ancient Near East um, in, in those cultures. Um, so their, their names are listed. The, the author comments on their, on their beauty as people, as, as individuals. Uh, the author is silent on the sons of Job. So in, just interesting there culturally to look at that. That's unusual in the ancient Near East. Um, then it says, um, Job lived 140 years. He saw four generations of descendants and died an old man full of days. Um, his, the ending of Job is similar to the ending of the patriarchs of Genesis. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, and you could even add Joseph there. Um, and Job sees one more generation of descendants than, than Joseph saw at the end of Genesis. Um, one thing that's often overlooked as we kind of wrap up this morning, one thing that's often overlooked as part of the vindication of Job is the defeat of Satan. Because ultimately the story is not about Job. The story is about God and God's um, power over Satan and his ability to demonstrate grace to his people. And so, if you remember at the beginning of the, pro, at the prologue, the beginning of Job, 
the Satan, the accuser, in Hebrew it's a proper night, it's the accuser, the Satan, is a dominant figure. Remember, he comes twice before the presence of the Lord and presents himself. Where do you find him in the epilogue? He's missing in action. He gets no words. He is absent completely. He has been totally defeated. He does not even get a voice at the end. That silence demonstrates his defeat. He's given no attention in the final verses of the book of Job because his role is insignificant. He's been defeated. He's a conquered enemy. So just it's easy to miss that because he's not mentioned. There's no word there at the end of 40, chapter 42 where it says, and Satan was defeated and bound and chained for a thousand years, and et cetera, et cetera, similar to Revelation. That's not there. He's just irrelevant. He's been defeated. Um, he's gone. So a couple of summary points on the book of Job. I've got just four quick points. I'll, five, I'll go real quickly so we can have some discussion here. Um, and these are all redemptive historical, reading Job in light of the New Testament. Um, by the end of Job, Job is no longer just a priest for his family. Remember the beginning, verse 5 of chapter 1, Job was a priest for his family. Now he's a priest for others. He's a mediator for others. Um, you can see in that some Christological significance as a mediator for others. Who is the ultimate mediator? It's Christ. Christ is the mediator for uh, not only the people of Israel, but also, Romans 9-11, through 11, mentioned earlier, also for the Gentiles. Second thing, twice in the prologue, the beginning of Job, and four times in the end, in the epilogue, Job is referred to as my servant. Okay, if, if there's a pop quiz this morning, in the Old Testament, is my, is my servant a, a common description of people or an uncommon description? If we did a quiz on that, it would be somewhat uncommon. It's only kind of the big guys in the Old Testament, generally speaking, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, and David. To say that you're a servant of God, slave of God, uh, is, is a compliment. Um, and, and only a handful of people get it. Job gets that here. Um, there's also one in the Old Testament who is a true servant of God. That's in Isaiah. There is the suffering servant passages. There is one true servant who is coming, who is Christ. Um, the next question, I want you to think about these and think, is, does this describe Job or Jesus? Okay, And I'll give you the answer to the question. It describes both as you read the book of Job. So, there was a righteous man. Is that Job or is that Jesus? Well, it's, it's both. Ultimately, it's Christ. Second of all, the righteous man is handed over by God for suffering. Is that Job or Jesus? It's, it's really both. A righteous man is mistreated by others. That's both. A righteous man prayed for those who opposed and persecuted him. We just saw that. Job does that. Christ does that. Even for Peter, who, I don't even know this guy, Jesus. Uh, this righteous man, after a bloody sacrifice, we saw that in Job, becomes a mediator between God and sinners. Job does that. Christ is the one who ultimately does that. After a sacrifice, Job has the benefit of, it's an animal who dies. Christ is the one who dies himself. And then mediates uh, a covenant of grace to his people. A righteous man is publicly vindicated by God. That's Job here with his friends. Ultimately, it's Christ. Vindicated by God uh, through the empty tomb, through the resurrection, ultimately through his ascension to the throne, and finally when he returns. Um, the end of Revelation talks about that. Uh, and then finally, a righteous man is exalted and receives greater honor and wealth than he had before. So that's part of the point of Job. He receives greater honor, wealth, everything is greater than before. Think about Christ after his, his execution at the cross, after his resurrection. He is, read 1 Corinthians 15. He has given a kingdom. that belong, We talked about this a few Sunday nights ago. He's given a kingdom. Everything belongs to him. Um, read the book of Revelation. It's all his. He's given a greater visible recognition. He still has all authority before. He's given a visible recognition from his church. Uh, a couple of thoughts here. Job looks to a mediator, a redeemer, a divine witness throughout the book of Job. You see that in chapter 9. You see that in chapter 16. You see that in chapter 19. You see that in chapter 33. We've talked about those over the last few weeks. Uh, Christ is that final redeemer. Um, so one example, um, Job 19.25, I know that my redeemer or mediator lives and he will stand upon the earth. Job 9.33, there is no arbiter between us, Job and his friends. There is no mediator. He's wanting a mediator. Christ is that mediator. Um, and then finally, uh, in, in, a, in the Reformed tradition and somewhat in the Lutheran tr tradition, the primary purpose of the book of Job is to prepare readers for the work of Christ. The primary purpose of Job 
is not about the question of suffering and evil, although that is important. The primary purpose is to point you forward to an innocent man who will come, who will suffer for the sins of his people. Um, and so uh, one, one Old Testament scholar says, the book of Job is the first draft of the gospel story. I think that's a good way to look at Job. It's the first draft. Um, and the fundamental theme of the book of Job is not to answer the why question. Uh, rather, the questions are who and where. Job, who are you to speak to God? Know your place, Job. And then finally, Job, where were you when God says, when I was doing all these things? Know your place. Know humility. Um, important thing during Pride Month to have humility. So anyway, let me stop there.